And I've entitled the message today, A Light in the Darkness. And the next portion of this prophetic scripture that we're going to look at is usually, sometimes prophecy is a little difficult, right? And this week is no different. This portion of prophecy is, is a little bit difficult. It's a little bit hard because you'll see why. You'll see why in just a second. But as we get into Jesus' words today, our goal is to understand what he's trying to teach his disciples, not trying to pick apart and find specifics about prophecy. We want to know what he's teach what Jesus is trying to teach his disciples and what that means for us today. So, but before we dig into scripture, I want to take an opportunity to just pray. Uh, So join me in prayer today. God, we thank you for who you are. God, we thank you for your word that reveals all of this to us, God. We thank you that, Jesus, as you answered the disciples' questions, as you answered the questions of your disciples, you left them and had them written down for us that you're still teaching. Jesus, you're still teaching us through these words about the end of the age, God. It's a question that rings in all of our hearts. But God, today you're still teaching. So Holy Spirit, we welcome you. We invite you. Your presence is necessary. It's you. Scripture tells us it's you, Holy Spirit. It's your work to open our minds and our hearts to the Scripture. So God, wherever we happen to be, whether we're watching online, whether we're here in person, God, I pray that your Holy Spirit speaks to us today because we want to hear your voice. Jesus, I pray that you speak to uh, open our ears to hear your voice. Open our minds to understand what you're saying, because God, sometimes we can get confused, and open our hearts to just dare to believe that what you're telling us is true. Teach us today. Bring us closer to you. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right, Matthew chapter 24. We're going to start in verse 15, and we're going to cover a little bit of ground today. So, uh, So verse 15, Jesus says, therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation, which was spoken through... Uh, spoken of through Daniel the prophet, standing in the holy place, let the reader understand, then those who are in Judea must flee to the mountains. Whoever's on the housetop must not go down to get things out of the house, and whoever's in the field must not turn back to get his cloak. But woe to those women who are pregnant and those who are nursing babies in those days. Moreover, pray that when you flee, it will not be winter or Sabbath, For then there will be great tribulation, such as not occurred since the beginning of the world until now, nor will ever again. And if those days had not been cut short, no life would have been saved. But for the sake of the elect, those days will be cut short. So then if anyone says to you, behold, here is the Christ, uh, or he is over there, do not believe them. For false Christs and false prophets will arise and will provide great signs and wonders, so as to mislead, if possible, even the elect." Behold, I've told you in advance. So if they say to you, Behold, he's in the wilderness, don't go out. Behold, or behold, he's in the inner rooms, don't believe him. For just as the lightning comes from the east and flashes as far as the west, so will the coming of the Son of Man be. Wherever the corpse is, uh, the vultures will gather. So, this before we dig into the kingdom principle, before we dig into what Jesus is trying to teach, we have to understand, uh, we have to talk about a couple of things. Uh, prophetic statements like the ones that Jesus made here can be um, confusing, I guess maybe is a, a good word. Uh, we can focus on the wrong things and it leads us down a, a path of, of kind of craziness and we miss the point of what people are saying, what Jesus is saying. Have you ever been part of that conversation where you know, you're having a conversation with somebody? It happens with me all the time with my wife, right? So we'll be having a conversation and something will stick out in my mind, and she, the train keeps moving, but I'm heading this direction because something she said stuck in my head, and I just went in a different direction. Anybody been like that? Right? Okay. No, maybe just me. Okay. So maybe just me. So here's prophetic statements like this can be a little confusing. What, we have to take it back. What did the disciples ask? In the beginning of the chapter, they were marveling about, Jesus, look at the temple. Isn't it so magnificent? Isn't it so awesome? And Jesus says, hey, look, there's going to come a day where not one stone is stacked upon the other. The whole temple is going to be raised. It's going to come down to the ground. It kind of shocks the disciples a little bit. And so they say, it says a little bit later on as they continue walking, they come to Jesus and they say, Jesus, when's that going to happen? What are the signs that, are going to be, that we're going to see that means you're ascending to power, to authority? And what are the signs surrounding the end of the age? And Jesus has been answering these questions, right? Did they ask him, never mind, I'm going to get ahead of myself if I go there. So 
Um, so Jesus has been giving them these signs to look for. In this portion, Jesus is connecting a, uh, a very specific figure from the prophecies of Daniel to the questions they've asked. Okay? He's, con- he's connecting a very specific identity from the book of Daniel and from the prophecies of Daniel to the questions they've asked. Okay? Jesus isn't answering a question they didn't ask. And we got to keep that in mind, all right? So prophecy in the book of Daniel is already connected to the end of the age. And the abomination of desolation is something that really sticks out to people in Christianity uh, who have maybe have been in church for a while because they understand what generally that means. We'll talk about that in a second. Uh, but the abomination of desolation is a very key figure in Daniel's prophecies. If you want to look at, it, at the, spe- the specific prophecies about the abomination of desolation, you can go back to da- the book of Daniel, look in chapters 8, chapter 9, chapter 11, and chapter 12. Okay? He's all through those four chapters, and he's very specific and very active in those chapters. Okay? So when Jesus says, let the reader understand, he actually says that. And he's saying that to the disciples, and he's saying, if you're reading the book of Daniel, understand the tie-in. Let the reader of Daniel, let you, I just want you to understand that I'm connecting very specifically back to Daniel's work. So we're referencing Daniel's work, I'm talking about it, and we're casting that off into the future. Okay? So, where it gets confusing is that prophecy can sometimes mean several different things. Prophecy can connect to different places. For example, from our perspective today, this idea of the abomination of desolation and and what what Jesus is talking about, the prophecies of Daniel have already been linked to several things. During the Maccabean Wars, where Rome invaded Israel, and uh, and you have the Hebrew people revolting, you can connect what Daniel says in prophecy to that point. That was before even Jesus was even born. You can also connect this to 70 AD when Titus comes and destroys Jerusalem. It can be connected there. And Jesus says it also connects to the questions about the end of the age and the time when Jesus is going to come to authority. So you've got one prophecy that seems to connect at least in three different places. See how it can get confusing? They're asking for one thing and Jesus is giving them three connections. Okay? So... What we've been studying in this section, uh, we've been looking at Jesus' words as if he's painting this picture about what life looks like at the end of the age. And, uh, but in, with this specific passage, people get more concerned about the identity. Like, they get stuck on that abomination of desolation, right? Like, who is that? What is that? How does that connect to the end of the age? And we look for that. That's a sign. Like, I want to see it. I want to know who it is. And we'll be able to point to it and go like, yeah, yeah, that's it. You know, we'll get to all that. Hold on. Stay with me. But the point of what Jesus is saying is not an identity. It's a sign. Okay? So follow us here. Follow with me here. So we're going to go through, um, we're going to go through this passage of Scripture a little bit. And we're going to pull out the general idea of what Jesus is trying to teach. Okay? Because we want to know what Jesus is teaching. If he taught the disciples, it was, if it was valid enough to teach the disciples, it's valid enough to teach us. Right? I want to hear what Jesus is saying. So, let's go back. At the end of the age, the first point I want to make is, at the end of the age, the world will be a dark place, and most likely the world won't even realize it. Okay? Flip back just a couple extra verses to verse 12. At the, at the beginning of verse 12... It says, because lawlessness is increased, the, most, the love of most people will grow cold. Remember we talked about this last week. The agape love of the church and things like this will become cold. But it becomes cold, why? Because of lawlessness. Increased lawlessness, where? In the world, right? Lawlessness, what, what does that mean? Okay, so Jesus is talking lawlessness. Who is he talking to? His disciples. Right? So what does that mean? The, to them, the law very specifically is God's law. God's very law. So he says, in the last days, the people's were, uh, in, in their day, in the time that Jesus is talking, their life centered around their God. 
And the life that you lived centered around the rules of your God. If your God says do this, then you did that. Your entire life was built on the worship of your God. Okay? So Jesus says, in the last days, lawlessness will be rampant, which means people won't care about God. And because people don't care about God, things are going to kind of spiral downhill, right? It's evil. It's not connected with God. It's not connected with Jesus. The entire culture uh, it no longer con- cares about honoring the command or the lifestyle that God has taught in Scripture or that Jesus has taught, right? Sound familiar to anyone? I mean, if you're familiar with with Scripture and things like this, and you're trying to live your life in a way that honors God, and you look outside or you look around at the world around us, what do you see? Lawlessness increasing. People don't care about living by the law or by the rule or the the example or the image of God, right? Okay? And Jesus says that's going to keep going. That's going to increase all the way up to the end, right? So hold on to that idea We're going to come back and circle back and tie this in for just a second. I just gave you one half of the shoelace. I'm going to give you the other half here in just a second. We're going to tie them together, okay? Lawlessness, the the people not caring about God, is going to increase in the world, okay? So let's look at the abomination of desolation. This isn't a title. It's a description. It's not a title. Somebody's not wearing this name badge, hello, my name is, abomination of desolation, right? It's a description, right? We all have descriptors that we can use about ourselves or our family or our kids. You know, when you start to, like, when you, when you, when somebody asks you, who is that? You give them their name, but then you say, well, they're about this tall, they're about, you know, you know, they're about this thick, you know, or whatever. Like, you start giving them descriptors of that person. This isn't a title that Jesus is using. This is a description. The abomination of desolation. Um, The abomination... It's an abomination to God. This, what, what this person or what this thing, what it stands for, we'll get to that in a second, what, whatever this abomination is, it is an abomination to God. Jesus is describing it, so from his point of view, from his perspective, it's like this is an abomination. This, uh, this doesn't care about me. This doesn't include me. This is wicked. This is evil, right? This is in that lawlessness region. He's like the chiefest of worst, Right? And so it's an abomination to God, and it causes desolation. The the abomination is characterized by the desolation and destruction that it causes and that it leaves behind. We all know people (laughs) that we might characterize as, wow, they are like this whirlwind of activity, and they leave destruction in their wake, right? We can all kind of latch a hold of that. Most of this... um, attach that to like our kids when they were younger, right? I just cleaned this room, right? And you come in five minutes. You were in here five minutes. How does this room get so messy in five minutes, right? Anybody ever have kids like that? Still do? Okay. You understand what I'm saying? So it's a description. Jesus is saying, this is an abomination to me, and in its wake causes all kinds of chaos, all kinds of uh, desolation, all kinds of just, just muck and gunk, and just, he's like, this is a destructive, and uh, this thing is destructive, okay? So it's not an ident- it's an identity, not a, uh, it, it's, it's a characterization, it's a description, not necessarily an identity. So at its core, this abomination is anti-Christ, Okay? And if you've been in church for very long, or maybe if you even haven't, you've heard that term before, anti-Christ, right? So this abomination is anti-Messiah. It's anti-God. It's anti-kingdom. It's anti-the kingdom of God, okay? We latch on to that term anti-Christ. Um, it, it's been this, this idea of anti-Christ throughout the years, you can attach it to a movement, you can attach it to a symbol. You can attach it to a person, but it doesn't necessarily mean it's going to be a person. There, okay, look. The, if it's a movement, it's going to have a, a figurehead, right? If it's a, a group of people, it's going to have kind of a leader, right? If it's a symbol, there's going to be someone who's leading that underneath that symbol. You understand what I'm trying to say? 
but it's not necessarily. Jesus is saying what's going to happen in the end, because the lawlessness is increasing, there's going to be this anti-Christ thing in the world, whether it's a, an, like a symbol or whether it's a movement or whether it actually is a specific person, right? There's an abomination of desolation at work in the world. Are you following me? Okay. So what Jesus is saying is that um, this anti-person sign or movement will set itself up, will be found in the holy place. Okay, I know I'm giving you a lot of intellectual stuff. We have to dig through this to understand what Jesus is trying to give his disciples, okay? He's going to be found in the holy place. Now, the holy place is the part of the temple where the priests would do most of their work. It's not the outer courts where they're sacrificing animals. It's just in beyond, uh, if you're familiar with the layout of the temple, the, the holy place has the table of showbread, which represents a communion with God. It has the lampstand, the, the, the seven fingers with the menorah. You, most of you have probably seen what that is, uh, which represents the presence and the power of the Holy Spirit and the work of the Holy Spirit in people. It's got the altar of incense before the presence of God, which represents the prayers of the saints. And it says this symbol or this movement or this person or this, this abomination that causes desolation is going to be found there. It's going to be there in that holy place. Now, this abominate, this abominate, blah, 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 blah. Let's see if I can do, say it without putting a V in there. This abomination is eventually going to find itself wedging its way between people and God. That's what Jesus is saying. The abomination of desolation is going to find itself in a position where it's going to try to interrupt the worship of God or maybe gather the worship that is due God. Okay? You're following what Jesus is saying here. So, what Jesus is saying is that in those days, the lawlessness, here's where we're tying it together, the lawlessness is so pervasive that people are going to see this symbol or this movement or this person that specifically as far away from the kingdom of God as you can get, and it'll be so great, they're going to see it as something so great that they will truly honor it as if it is God. Are you following? Okay, this is what Jesus is trying to say. This is what Jesus, in my opinion, is what he's trying to teach his disciples. The lawlessness, we just talk, he just like hits on it and goes further, but then he kind of swings back around to this idea of lawlessness in the world. And in that time where Jesus is going to come to power and Jesus is going to, or the, the, the end is going to come and the kingdom is going to be set up, he's showing us that the world will be so far away from God, it will consider evil things or bad things as good. Anybody else trigger any other scriptures in your head? Come on, if you've been in church, you've heard other scriptures that immediately reference that. Okay? And so they're going to see this evil thing that is as far away from the kingdom of God as you can get. They're going to see it as the best thing ever. Okay? So that's the first thing. The second thing that Jesus is trying to teach is there's going to be direct contact between God's people and the lawlessness and the abomination. Look at this. The world is going to experience difficulty. The world is going to experience tribulation because of this abomination. Okay? And the church isn't exempt from what the world experiences. Look, we talked about the first set of signs in verses 4 through 8, and the church is not exempt from that. We talked about the signs of the church a couple weeks ago. I think it was a couple weeks ago. Maybe there was, yeah, I think it may have been last week. Anyhow, and the church is definitely not exempt from those. Those are signs or things that are going to happen in the church. But as the world experiences difficulty because they're follow, falling farther and farther away from God, even the amped up difficulties at the end of the age, they will have an impact on the church. They will have an impact on the people of God. Let me show you specifically out of this section that we're reading. Take a look at what Jesus says. Verse 15, when you see. Who? Who's he talking to? 
when you see the abomination. Look at 16. Those who are in Judea, specifically God's chosen people, the Hebrew people. Verse 22, the days of tribulation are limited for the sake of who? The elect. Who are the elect? God's family. The days of tribulation are limited. What does that mean? It means that people who are following God are going to see and experience this, this tribulation, right? Verse 23, if anyone says to you, to who? To you. So you have to be around for them to be speaking to you. Are you following? Verse 25, I have warned you in advance. I don't want you to be taken by surprise when all of this happens. Look, okay, I know some of you are immediately going to, like, have this, this issue in your heart and soul because of some, some teaching that you've maybe been a part of and that kind of a thing. And I'm not here to discuss today, this is next week, I'm not here to discuss like rapture theories or the rapture and that kind of a thing. We can have that conversation separately, maybe over lunch if you want to do that or something like this. Uh, you know, call me up, send me an email or, you know, call me on the phone this week or something. We can talk about those kinds of things. I don't have a problem talking with those things. I'm just saying this is what Jesus has said. And he's warning his disciples in advance because when it happens, he doesn't want the disciples to lose their heart, to lose their connection, right? Immediately in the tribulation of those days, you will see, you will experience, you will, I'm telling you in advance, when you hear, right? Be strong, stand strong, don't lose your heart, right? Um, so, like I said, we're, we're discussing those end times. We're not necessarily discussing rapture theories. If we want to, just a little bit of a preview, we're talking about that next week. So, we'll tie all this together with your ideas of theories of, about rapture, which is cool and great, and let me, that's just a little bit of a preview. We're talking rapture next Sunday. Be here. It's fun. All right? So, um, So what Jesus is teaching his disciples is that their lives, even their lives as followers of Christ, are going to be impacted by the abomination of desolation in the world, right? So what Jesus is warning his disciples and teaching his disciples is no matter what happens in this world, don't let go of God. Look, your life might fall apart. Your life might be impacted by some other people's decisions. Your life might be totally impacted because somebody else has chosen to do something and your life is suddenly torn apart or ripped apart or begins to fall apart because of of death or destruction or hurt or pain or emotional difficulty, mental difficulty because somebody else made a decision in this world. It's not the kingdom of God. It's as far from the kingdom of God as possible, but you have to sit and deal with it. Don't let go of God. Jesus died. He came and he died for your sin and for my sin that we might have connection with him, okay? And it doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter what you've done. that, That sacrifice is good enough to cover the sin and the difficulties you had in your life. And God wants you to be connected to him. He wants you as part of his family. He wants you to be part of the family. Look, when you have an argument with your spouse, the the marriage isn't over just because you had an argument. You might have a disagreement or a hard time might come up, and you might not know how you're, you're going to pay for the next bill or something or how you're going to get food on your table, but the marriage doesn't split up just because there's a difficulty, and that's what we're trying to get. The world is going to have a lot of chaos and a lot of difficulty. It's going to impact the church, and Jesus is saying, I've warned you in advance. Don't let go. If you see it, well, I'm going to get ahead of myself, but we're gonna, if you see it, run but don't let go of me. Don't let go of me. Look, I can't imagine the world getting any more farther away from God than it already is, but prophetically and scripturally, it's going to. If what I read in my Bible is true, I I really don't want to be the, the doom and gloom guy, but here it is. If what I read in my Bible is true, it's going to get a whole lot worse before it gets any better. Oof. 
And while it gets worse out in the world, don't let go of God. Don't let go of God. Don't let go of Paul, man, there are certain people that when I get to heaven, I want to see face to face. I want to have conversations. Paul is one of those for me. Man, you were put in prison. You were beat, shipwrecked a billion times. You know, just, just had all these difficulties, and yet you didn't let go of God. What drove you? What, what made you hang on so tight? Because some of the things that Paul would have experienced, you and I might have said, no, nope, that's it. I give up. And Paul says, they can take my life, but they can never take my Jesus. Right? The world might get bad, guys, gals, ladies, gentlemen. Don't let go of God. And just as an aside, I don't know what any of you are going through right now, today, in this moment. Maybe you're watching online. I don't know what you're going through. Don't let go of God. It says he, is a, he loves us and he cares about us and the doorway is open and we can walk in on, into his presence at any time and say, God, I'm burdened by this. This thing is weighing me down. This is an abomination. This is as anti-kingdom is, and it's, it's really stressing my relationship with you. He says, says, you've got to do something with that. He says, cast those cares on Jesus. Cast those cares on God because he cares for you. Don't let go of God. Don't let go of God. Third thing he's saying, God's people have a responsibility to be light in this darkness. Mm, Responsibility. Grab that word. God's people have a responsibility to be light in the darkness, right? Jesus says, when you recognize the abomination in the holy place, flee. Get out of Dodge. Move. Leave. Matter of fact, it says, uh, if you're on the rooftop, don't go downstairs. You know what that, it, it, they, the way they built their homes back in Israel in that day, in that time, the rooftop was like a second living room, right? In the evening, you know, they'd go outside, they'd have stairs that would go up to the roof, and they would just kind of lounge out there. It'd be like a second, a second place where they all gathered together and hung out. It says, if you're there, don't go down the stairs. Run across the housetops from house to house to house, like some action-adventure movie, right? Just run Get out of Dodge as fast as you can. Don't go, won't worry about going downstairs. Don't collect the family photos, right? Collect the family. Don't collect the photos. Don't worry about the extra coats. Don't worry about the money you got in the bank. Get out of Dodge, right? Look, it says get away from that. It says get away from the influence. Get away from the authority. Get out of its reach if you can. Do something. Get away from it. Don't worry about this oppression. It's going to hold you down. It's going to be a force. It's an abomination to God. It causes desolation. Get out from its reach if you can. Go to the mountains. Go to the hills. Go live like a hermit. Do something. You know, and I'm sure Jesus is saying this a little bit tongue in cheek, uh, tongue in cheek. But at the same time, there's a seriousness about it. Don't let it be hovering over your life. Don't oppress. Don't let it oppress you to the point where you're ready to, to let go of God. Don't let go of God, but get out of its influence. Get out of its oppression. Get out from underneath its authority. Right? Go to the mountains, hide in the caves, but don't let it rule over you. Now, in my opinion, this is more about spiritual preservation than it is physical preservation. Right? If you're in Christ, your death does not change your salvation. If you're in Christ, your death does not change your salvation. So Jesus isn't saying, get out, save your life, save yourself, get out, run, flee. He's not trying to get them to save themselves or prolong their life here on this earth. Because if you're in Christ, that's something they can't take from you. They can't take your hope. They can't steal your future. They are not more powerful than the blood of Jesus. They're just not. Paul says they can kill me, they can maim me, they can do whatever they want to me, but they can't take the Jesus. It's, they can't take, they didn't give it to me, they can't take it away. Right? If you are in Christ, no matter what the world does, it can't change the, the status of your salvation. So Jesus isn't talking about self preservation and the extension of your life, but what he is talking about, he, if you let go of God, 
If you let go of God, the witness you have is gone. The light is extinguished. The world is going to be so incredibly as far away from the kingdom of God and the light of God as it can possibly get. What God needs is light. What God needs is light. He says, if you notice this, this abomination that causes desolation, run! Get out from underneath its authority because it will crush you. But don't stop being the light. Live in a place where you can be light. By preserving ourselves, we're able to maintain the light of the gospel, even the greatest of darkness. Look, folks, our first responsibility is to the kingdom of God. If you are a child of God, your first responsibility is the kingdom of God. And part of that responsibility is your light. Part of that responsibility is your witness. Part of that responsibility is your testimony. Part of that responsibility is to be an ambassador for the kingdom of God so that where everywhere you step, you're bringing the kingdom of God with you. And see, the thing is, Jesus rose from the dead. By his death on the cross and his resurrection, he conquered hell, death, and the grave. He conquered everything dark. So darkness has no impact on you. But what Jesus needs is no matter how dark it gets in the world, he needs light. He needs people who are willing to say, this is my story. This is my testimony. This is my experience with the king and the God of the universe. I know it may not look good right now. I know it may look bleak. I know it may look dark. And I know you may not like me for saying this, but Jesus is my Savior. And he's come to save you too. His blood is strong enough to cover as a, his sacrifice is big enough to take care of whatever has separated you from him. God has made all the provisions to bring you back together, and he wants you as part of the kingdom. You may not like hearing that because you are so anti kingdom of God. But I need to tell you, I'm not going to let my life or my light be extinguished by the difficulty and the abomination and the desolation in the world. Right? This isn't about self-preservation. This is about preservation of the light of the kingdom in the darkness. It's like, see, I've told you ahead of time. I want you to recognize this. I want you to be this, right? Look, I want to begin to wrap up. The world is going to get dark. The world is going to get dark. It's going to have an impact on Christians. It's going to have an impact on the body of Christ. But don't let go of Christ, and don't let your light be extinguished. We used to sing a song. Anybody remember that when we were a kid? This little light of mine. Right? I'm not going to sit there and sing it, you know, because <laughs> copyright issues in the video and all that. But, but you have the choice. You can choose to hide it when the difficulty comes, or you can choose to be the light that the world needs. You can hide it and let the darkness rule, or you can shine the light of the kingdom of God and be exactly what the kingdom of God wants you to be. Oh, they may not like me. I don't care. Shine your light or hide it. Your choice. I might lose friends. I might lose family. Family might be estranged. Mm -hmm. All right, now I'm going to meddle a little bit. Your choice. Hide your light or let it shine. The kingdom of God is your family. It's the body of Christ. And one of these days I'm going to live for all eternity, forever, with Him. Like I said last week, I'm playing the long game. I'm not playing the, for the now. Like, look, I want my family to be there. I want my sisters and my uncles and my aunts and my cousins. I saw a lot of them yesterday. I want my family to be there. But I'm not going to exchange their relationship for my heavenly relationship. This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. The kingdom of God needs light. Look, regardless of what happens in this world, don't exchange your life. Regardless of what happens, don't let go of Christ. And the second thing, regardless of how dark it gets, be the light. Be the light. 
be the light. Okay? Stand with me, would you please? We'll, uh, we'll close this out here. Today, we're going to get into a time of response to God. And I understand if you're here in person, we don't have these, the altar benches that we've had before. Um, we're trying to get them back together and everything else. Um, but I'll just for today, maybe you just come and stand around the altars or maybe even kneel at the stage or whatever. Look, the only thing, what makes an altar an altar is a sacrifice. So you can make a sacrifice anywhere, right? They made sacrifices on piles of stones in the wilderness. You know, you can make a sacrifice anywhere and it becomes an altar to God. So if you're here in person, you know, we want to give an opportunity to respond to God. If you're virtual, if you're with us online, we want you to take a few moments after this video is over and, and take some time to respond to God. Don't just, don't just let the, the, the end and just check out after that, but respond to God. But here's the, here's the question I want you to kind of mut, uh, mull over in your head for just a moment. How bright is your light? How bright is your light? In the world that we live in, can the world see the light of Christ in and through your life? When the world looks at you, does it see Jesus? Maybe you don't know Christ. Maybe you don't have a relationship today. Well, let me tell you, God loves you. He's done everything to open the doorway to you, and you can, you can, you can, Today, you can start a relationship with the King of kings and the Lord of lords and the one true God. You can have a relationship with God. All it takes is say, God, be the king of my life. I'm sorry for everything that I've done. I need different leadership. I've messed my life up royally. God, just be the king of my life. I surrender to you. Forgive me and be the king. Really, something along those lines. And you have you can be assured that there's going to be a change. You're going to feel the presence of God in the kingdom of God, and your light is going to begin to glow. But for those of you who have been Christians for a while and part of the family of God for a while, I have to ask you, how bright is your light? Have you found times where you've taken the bushel and put it over the flame? Can the world see Jesus in and through you? Father, I've done what you've asked me to do. God, I've said what you've asked me to say. Holy Spirit, I pray that you do what only you can do. Jesus, we wanted to hear you today. We wanted to hear your heart. We wanted to hear what you were trying to get the disciples to understand. God, forgive us for sometimes getting stuck on a certain passage or a certain section of, of your word. But today, God, we hear your encouragement. We hear what you're trying to teach the disciples. We hear the instructions. And God, God, this world is moving away from you. The world that we live in, Kosciuszko County, Warsaw even, is being influenced and led away from you. It may not be incredibly obvious to the naked eye as far as how far it's moving, but God, we see that it is, it is against, the movement is against the kingdom of God by and large. God, I pray for your people's sake. God, give us rods of iron down our spine to stand for you when the world is asking us to bow. Give us the strength to speak the testimony that we have when the world is asking us to be quiet. God, give us wisdom to share the kingdom in the darkest of places when you ask us instead of trying to put that, trying to exist and coexist with the darkness. God, make us your kids. Make us to be part of your kingdom. And God, I pray for anyone, whether they're here in, line, or here in person or virtual and online, if they don't know you. God, I pray that you would be stirring in their heart and drawing them and pulling them to you even now, even now. Just revealing yourself in your love, saying, I love you, I want to know you, I want you to know me, I just want you to be, have a connection with me. God, I pray that you would move in their hearts and lives. 
But God, today I pray you draw every person to you. Every person. Whether they've never known you or whether they've known you all their, their lives. God, I pray that you would draw every person by the work of your Holy Spirit today. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name, amen. Would you take a few moments to respond to God today?